Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina ve habibina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve ashabihi. O men ihtida bi hadihi ve istenne bi sünnetihi ila yevmi din amma ba'd. <coughs> Welcome everyone to Project Ihya podcast once again. Uh, this is the first one for this new year and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this year one of khair and baraka for everyone. Today we have a very important guest with us, Sheikh Yusuf Susi. Sheikh, welcome to the podcast. Hayakum Allah, it's an honor to be here. Barakallahu alaykum. Barakallahu Sheikh is a student of Sheikh Walid al-Manisi, with whom he studied various Islamic sciences. Sheikh also studied in Egypt, completing the memorization of the Holy Quran. Sheikh also holds a bachelor's degree in Islamic studies, along with various certificates and ijazas. And uh, we know Sheikh Yusuf Susi from his many lectures throughout the country, as well as his insights shared on social media. Because our guest is known for his outspoken nature on sensitive topics, where he does not shy away from frankly presenting the Islamic truths to his audience, we wanted to discuss the topic of truth itself, speaking it, living it, and upholding that responsibility in the face of societal or even political pressures. The struggle between, between truth and falsehood, haq and batil, is as old as humanity itself. From the creation and vicegerency of our father, Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, shaitan set out on the path of misguidance and falsehood. In Islam, there is a notion that where truth is not present, falsehood takes root. Dispelling falsehood is achieved by shining the light of truth upon it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Isra, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ بَعْدَ عُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا And say truth has come and falsehood has vanished. Verily falsehood is ever vanishing. Imam Tabari rahimahullah ta'ala explains under this verse that الْحَقُّ كُلُّ مَا كَانَ لِلَّهِ فِيهِ رِضًا وَطَاعًا وَأَنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كُلُّ مَا كَانَ لَا رِضًا لِلَّهِ فِيهِ وَلَا طَاعًا مِمَّا هُوَ لَهُ مَعْصِيَةٌ وَلِلشَّيْطَانِ طَاعًا Imam Tabari rahimahullah, he's explaining that truth, what is truth and what is falsehood. He says that truth encompasses all that comprises the pleasure and obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. While falsehood comprises all that of sins which are void of the pleasure and the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and entailing of, diso- of obedience to shaitan. So in a world where falsehoods are flourishing along with the means of spreading them multiplying, this responsibility of bearing the burden of upholding truth is magnified many times over. So having said that, I want to go into the first question, but before I do, Hafiz Musab, if you want to just add, inshallah, a few words before we jump right into the discussion. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khairan, Sheikh Asadullah, for the beautiful introduction. I also personally wanted to welcome uh, Sheikh Susi and uh, just wanted to um, tell the audience that we have uh, many other, um, you know, beautiful podcasts and uh, guests lined up. So if everyone can just like the video and uh, uh, subscribe, inshallah, and uh, we'll go right into it now. Inshallah, if you want to go ahead and uh, do the first question or should I just go ahead? You can go ahead, inshallah. Bismillah. Bismillah. So in the recent past, we've seen a trepidation by Muslims to speak the truth as they've always understood it. As a result, our up-and-coming generations have started to exhibit a warped understanding of Islam and its moral positions, its truths. What do you think are the main causes of this trepidation and fear? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allahumma yassal li amri wa shrah li sadri wa hlul uqadatan min lisan yafqahu qawli. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he first unites us under his shade on Judgment Day, the same way we are united here as brothers uh, in this dunya, Allahumma ameen. And I also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever is said here and that we take away here, that it is a hujja for us on yawm al-qiyamah and not a hujja against us. Uh, that is a proof for us, not a proof against us, Allahumma ameen. Um, your your question is, it's, it's a loaded question and it definitely requires a lot of unpacking uh, because the, I, I think it's multi-layered and it's multi-pronged. Um, I think at the very, very top, uh, for those 
for those Muslims who are out there who are familiar with my work, who maybe follow some of my content, um, as modest as it is, um, I, I'm, I've been very, very critical uh, and not out of jealousy or out of envy, but I've been very, very super duper ultra critical of the way uh, Muslim Dawa discourse has been going, I'd say, for the past two, perhaps even three decades in America. And what I mean by that is that the, the message of the uh, the mashayikh, uh, the ulama, the, uh, the, the Muslim clerics in general, I think those who have uh, the responsibility and the voice to convey the undiluted message to the average Muslim. I think uh, over the years, it's been dwindling down. And I think we've been censoring ourselves, I think, more than anyone. It's No one is censoring us out there, I think, in, in the public sphere. I think we Muslims have been censoring ourselves. Um, and, and I said this a while back, even on uh, the Dean show, I said, the minute political correctness crept into our masajid, this is when I believe all help truly broke loose is when we uh, prioritized uh, people's feelings, which is not to say that we're there to necessarily hurt people's feelings. No, but the truth, yani, independently by itself, the truth hurts just by itself. Right. So that, that's an ex that's, I think, a part of our reality. OK, but I believe the over the years we've kind of forged for ourselves, I think, as Mashaikh and Duhad, what is normal to speak about and what is nor not normal to speak about? What's taboo? What's not taboo? Um, so, for, for example, th there are about five to ten subjects that each and every Muslim will walk into any given masjid and predict that out of these ten this khutbah is going to be out of those 10, right? Uh, and, and not to go through the 10 for the sake of brevity and because we have a lot of content to cover, but there are basic predictable recycled khutbahs, right? Um, Allah's love and mercy, I think that's at the top of the list. Um, uh, the, 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 the kindness of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his noble character, okay? And no one is to believe that I have a problem with these, these, these topics, no. I'm talking about the excessive routine nature that we go about it so much so that we've become numb to the message itself because we've heard it mm -hmm. for about the 10th, 20th, or 30th time. Uh, being good to your neighbors, right? Um, being involved in politics, that's like a wajib for a lot of Muslims today. Like that's mandatory. And if you're not, you can be shamed, right? You can't be shamed for anything else. I mean, mm. sarcastic here. You can't be shamed for anything <laughs> else. But if you don't participate mm. in politics and you're not playing a an active role, then we have every right to shame you, right? You are to be shamed, excommunicated, and all of the above, right? Um, so there are these are uh being good to your parents, right? Um not being not being judgmental, um, being being kind and being nice. There's about five, six, seven different topics that people kind of revolve around. And so there's what I think what happens is this is that anytime. Anytime that you chart to you start to forge for yourself a way other than the balanced way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you're going to have a lot of cracks, you're going to have a lot of problems, you're going to have a lot of uh, things that have to be settled later on and sometimes later on can be a bit too late, right? Uh, is there, I know I'm right I, if I want to interject here, that there's is there yeah. a fear here that we are kind of um falling into the same hole or the same trap that perhaps Christianity, because, you know, in Islam, as you mentioned rightfully, that Islam, there's this balance between Bashara and Indar or, you know, Tabshir and Indar of uh, giving glad tidings and talking about all the Fada'il and, you know, rewards and all the nice things. And then there's also this element of warning and prohibition. Um, and previous Umam, for example, maybe, you know, let's say uh, Christianity, for example, They've kind of gone in the direction heavily towards, you know, those topics, kindness, love, and and kind of shied away. Do you feel like there's a fear that we're also heading in that direction? Um, you know, it's funny that you, although this Allah is our witness, uh, we did not plan this, but I was in Seattle two weeks ago and I gave my lecture was specifically about how rigged everything is in, in Dawa discourse in America. And that's exactly uh, the Prophet, Ali Salatu Wasalam, he foretold about this, right? Yeah. That you would follow in the lizard's hole, cubit by cubit, span by span, even if they, the Jews and Christians, if they were to go into the lizard's hole, you would follow them, right? And here, basically, it's, it's, it's kind of signifying how hot uh, uh, and, and, and just not well ventilated a lizard's hole is. In other words, mm -hmm. irrespective of what they do, whether it's good or bad, you would do it. You won't consider what it is you're doing simply because 
they're doing it, then you would follow suit and do it as well, right? Um, <clears throat> but this is what I was getting at. Is, and this is why, by the way, this is the reason, the primary reason why you have so many Muslims out there who sound literally like Christians. And I'm yeah. sure you guys come across a lot of these this cringy, forgive me for being explicit, this cringy garbage out there that Muslims seem to be very fond of sharing. Right. Um, the idea of, oh, Islam is not about. And I wrote a tweet about this. Alhamdulillah, it, it got widely circulated by the pleasure, by, by Allah's grace. Um, it was about where you would. Uh, Islam is not about your hijab. It's not about your beard. It's not about how much you mm. pray. Islam is about having a good heart and being kind to others. Hello. Does anybody see a connection here? That's exactly <laughs> what Christianity has been reduced to. It's not about the laws, do's and don'ts. All that is, you know, for those um, judgmental, self-righteous, arrogant, religious people, you know. Um, yeah. And so it, it really when you talk about these things, that's the way you're depicted these days is that when you talk about the element of justice and that Allah does have expectations, it's not just about, you know, we're all, you know, going to Jannah and lovey-dovey and so on and so forth. So going back to what you said earlier, that that's precisely. Yeah, and uh, subhanAllah, just a few days ago, I saw one one Muslim, he uh, shared on Facebook, there was there was an infographic, which had, it said the most central teaching of every religion, right? Something like that, the most central uh, teaching of every religion, and it had like a bunch of religions, and it was just like, lo treat others as you would like to be treated. And even under Islam, it brought the hadith, uh, hatta yuhibba li ma yuhibba li But instead of tra uh, translating akhihi as your brother, even there, they translated akhi as uh, others. In humanity. Yeah, like, so, so yeah. even, you know, subhanAllah, we know that this is not the central message of Islam. Like uh, the central message of Islam is Tawheed, the 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 number one one message. But uh, you know, uh, you know, there's an effort to reduce every single religion just as a utility to be like a good person and get along with each other. So yeah, there was so I mean, I somebody sent a question earlier as well. They were talking about how um, uh, again the issue of hijab, and they said that I've seen you know muhajibas when they wear their hijab, they have this feeling of um, being better than others, therefore, you know, is it probably better for them not to wear the hijab? And I was thinking that what a logic or a principle that's totally foreign to Islam. For example, if I'm praying five times a day and I and it's making me feel better than somebody who's not praying five times a day, does that mean that I leave the salah? Like uh, that's a principle that we don't necessarily have. Yeah, that is a problem. We shouldn't have to kabbur in any sense. We don't know uh, a person's another person's relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, but. Um, it's like we're 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 kind of taking these principles, and as a, as a as a Muslim Ummah, we're sort of like accepting them as a, you know something that's that's so core that's supposed to shape the rest of the religion. And I was thinking that I guess this kind of follows in with that question: is that what is happening? The you know the political correctness or this air of these are things that I can't talk about. Is this probably? Is you know, who's to blame really? Is it the scholars or is it the fact? Is it the 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 masses themselves? Is the pressure coming from the masses? Is this a reflection of the masses? A sort of shift in thinking that now the scholars are, you know, and I guess both sides would have to bear some blame because when we see our scholars in the past, they didn't shy away from you know speaking hap or right. saying what Islam has to say, even though they went through you know we can read their biographies and their tarajim. And we find out the untold, you know, suffering they went through just to stand on hap. But um, it seems like, you know, th there's sort of a, a reflection of where the ummah is at right now. Where on the one side, the ummah is, feels like we only want to hear this one side or we want to be, you know, this uh, lovey-dovey sort of thing. And uh, on the other side, the Adama are feeling the heat and now they're also starting to, you know, temper their language. Well, I, I just want to, I think there's an important part that I, I think should be highlighted here. Um, and, and, and I'm sure this this might, I don't know, sound bizarre to some of you, but I just want to say this before answering your question, if you'll allow me. Um, yeah. I feel there's so much material out there. Wallahi, wallahi, by Allah, I believe there's so much material out there that helps you become a sinner and that actually is an incentive and it's a motivating factor for you to sin better than to be 
a God righteous, someone trying to do your best because no one, no one is claiming Isma here. No one is claiming yeah. to be perfect. But look at how it's portrayed, right? Today, when you speak of sinners, you're always spinner, sinners are always portrayed as those, you know, broken ones and they're struggling. I got news for you. Not uh, there are a lot of sinners who are not like that. But the problem is we've reduced all of the sinners. And when sinners here, we're all sinners, but we're talking mm. about sinners here who people who are just out there. They don't care. They don't have any filters in front of the world. If it's mocking the religion, if it's not praying, not where they don't care. They're all out there. Right. And they're proud of it. These are not people who are struggling. These are not broken people. Yeah. Broken people are those who have a sense of shame and remorse. And they're telling you, brother, I know. Keep me near your These people are in your face. Yes. Now, what are you going to do? This is how these people are. But now when it comes to practice in Muslims, we're reduced to being judgmental jerks, condemning everybody to hell because you pray five times a day. And you believe that he who does not pray five times a day is literally paving his way or her way to hell. OK, that you now by simply believing that you become judgmental and you're arrogant. And that's why you'll see a lot of these memes out there. I'll get back to the question. But this is why you'll see like a lot of these posts out there. Right. Where um, they'll take the call of Ibn al-Qayyim. Right. That a, a sinner who's broken is better than a, an obedient, arrogant worshiper. OK, but it doesn't stop there. It's not this or this because mm -hmm. someone might look at that and say, oh, boy. You know what? It, it makes you feel comfortable about being disobedient okay. and rebellious. Oh, I'd rather be the rebellious one who's broken inside. No, the, mm -hmm. the, it's, it's not for you to be the rebellious, uh, 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 the broken sinner, but it's also not for you to be the uh, up, uh, 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 the um, the uh, judgment. Forgive me, the content or the uh, proud worshiper. No, you're not. You want to be the broken worshiper. That's mm -hmm. the goal. But we forge this false dichotomy thinking like it's either or. And I see this. There's not a day that goes by on social media, only that you see someone sharing this. And so the sinner who sees that feels like they can identify with that, you know, and it makes them feel comfortable where they're at, not wanting, you know, uh, not wanting them to push themselves forward. Yeah. Um, so going back to what you have one, um, going back to what you mentioned earlier about the scholars, I believe the uh, there's a there's a kind of a, a, a nishtirak, right? I believe. Yeah. Um the, but the majority of the blame, if you were to ask me, I believe goes out uh, to the Imma, the Mashaykh, and the Duat. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because they're the ones with the knowledge. Yeah, they're the ones with the ilm. They're the ones with the hikmah. They're the ones who understand sunanullah al kawniya. They're what they're the ones who understand sunanullah al sharia. They're the ones who understand the seerah. They're the ones who understand that there are certain people who need to be shaken up because. People are human beings. Some people have soft skin. Some people have uh, uh, rough and tough skin. So and the ulama are the ones who kind of have to weigh. Well, you know what? I think we're drifting too far. It's about time that we remind Muslims of whatever A, B, C, X, Y, Z. But it doesn't help. It doesn't help that although some of the mashayikh might try to do that, they're unfortunately not welcomed by their own congregations. Yeah, I think right. even um, Sheikh Ibn Qudam al-Maqdisi, rahmahullah, he mentions in one of his books, uh, when he's talking about this, you know, giving glad tidings or takhweef, you know, scaring people. Tarheeb bin Tarheeb, right. Yeah, tar tarheeb, exactly, Tarheeb bin Tarheeb. Um, he actually mentions, the, uh, like, which one is for who? And he actually makes a difference between, as you did earlier, between the broken sinner and the, you know, adamant sinner, the one who's, you know, he says for the one that's adamant, you don't do necessarily targhib. Um, he said, do targhib. He said, then that's where the ayat of adab come. And that's where the ayat of, you know, punishment and reminder, um, you know, the stern warning comes. And, and I, like you said earlier, and, and wallahi, this is not, by the way, this is not some crazy rocket science. Um, this observation seems to be so intuitive and so basic um, that, there are some people you have that they have to be reminded of Allah's wrath and excruciating pain. And there are those people who truly have to be reminded because they're so broken. You don't yeah. remind a broken person of Allah's mercy, of, of Allah's wrath. The same way as someone who's adamant and is out there and they don't care how negatively they're influenced on other Muslims. You don't remind them of Allah's mercy. You have to remind them of it. Yeah. In a nutshell, that's what yeah. it is. But we've stopped at the first part. Oh, oh, messenger of Allah, convey to my people that I am the most gracious, most merciful. 
uh, in America, we've kind of stopped there. Yeah. But there's a second part. And also inform them, oh, Muhammad, that my punishment is severe. Mm -hmm. you, you know, know when we take uh, the... No, no. Sorry, sorry to cut you no, off. No, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead. Go I was ahead. saying there, it's something that you mentioned people understand intuitively when they talk about like raising children. There's times where you, you know, give them sort of a, a push and you encourage them. And then there's also, they, they talk about you have to set limits and you have to set, uh, what do you call consequences. So they understand that this is a ne necessary part of uh, shaping a human being, a perfect, you know, yes. human being. But, you know, that's, that's so you know, what you just mentioned, like, uh, like you just took the words from my mouth. But then <clears throat> I thought that uh, today, unfortunately, even in parenting, even in parenting, there are people who don't set limits. And this is very common in the West. So they'll uh, you see the results of that, right? Yeah. And we see the results of that. So even in parenting, that's why they're not able to extend that like basic instinct to uh, to Islam, because even in parenting, they're just uh, sometimes just like tarheeb all the time. And there's no, uh, you know, there's no uh, punishments. Limits, yeah. Can I can I can I just add something to that? Um, you know, it's funny. I feel like you opened up a can of worms, although this was not part of the program. But I think mm -hmm. it has to be said. Um, I'm very, very Again, super critical also. You're like, this guy's critical of everything. <laughs> no, no, I'm critical of the way parenting <laughs> is has been going. Like parenting, Muslim parenting these days, I, I'm very critical of it as well, right? Um, you'll find a Muslim, you'll find a Muslim who grew up, maybe has certain trauma, certain problems, um, and, and suddenly they feel like now they want to reinvent the wheel. They mm -hmm. read a book on psychology from a libertarian. They read a book by another non-Muslim on how to raise kids and so on and so forth. Suddenly they feel like now they have to reinvent the wheel, right? In a nutshell, that's why our generation, it was very difficult for us to look at our parents in the eyes because of so much haiba that we had for them. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't question your dad. You don't, Now I'm not saying that's good or bad, but there was an element of respect there. Now, sure. Can it use tweaking and adjusting? I think everything can use a little bit of adjusting and tweaking. It's a life struggle. It is. However, today, <laughs> today, the problem that I'm finding with certain parents is before telling their children to do something or not to do something, they have to sit there and reflect and ponder about it for an hour. I believe this is parental failure. If you have to sit there for an hour trying to pick the right time, the right word, well, maybe this, because you're so worried about, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings, but no, let's do that. I believe that's that's too much as a parent. Yes, you want to use wisdom. I'm all about using wisdom and picking the right time, but sometimes I need you to go do that now because I said so. Now is not the time for questions. Go get up and do that. Sometimes that should be enough. We give into this. I want to answer every question they have. No, there, you have to build. I believe there has to be that space between mm -hmm. the parents and the children that you're the parent at the end of the day. There are a lot of things that they're not going to comprehend nor understand because they're not at that age. They're not at that stage level yet. The higher yeah, age. I heard stories where uh, parents were asked about the gender of their child. And they're like, we don't know when they get you know a little older. They'll let us know what gender they want to be. Like it's it's gone into a very there's an extreme and that's kind of like the logical conclusion if we follow sort of this uh, I guess liberal uh, mindset which is like every person is an owner of themselves and they get to decide for themselves what you know um, you know the, the the path they chart in life and all of that kind of stuff and they've taken it we see the logical conclusion and a lot of Muslims when they hear about things like that they they're turned off and they're like oh that's kind of crazy but the position we've taken is going to lead to that like that is the logical conclusion uh if you allow it to go you know far enough and also and when I, the child I, sorry go ahead no, i just wanted to say and again i'm very big on this idea of uh not big on inferiority complex but this is what happens when you really believe inside that the others they are better superior you and you are inferior um but 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 honestly though if we were to look out in public don't you see how a lot of these little brats act towards their parents yeah. Really, look at the district just in, in your 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 daily Walmart, your daily Target. Where I don't know if you guys are boycotting them or not, but anyways, um, wherever you go, you have these bratty children, very disrespectful, very ill mannered, and then the Muslim uh, somehow that we that these are the results that you're gonna get. Yeah, right. Yeah, no. exactly. We I mean uh, we see it from our eyes. No. So true. Musab, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, I was saying that when, you know, when a child, when he, from the very beginning, he's used to authority, he's used to getting orders and commands from his parents in the natural way, obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, accepting his authority also comes a lot more naturally, right? 
So a person, a child who's who's never seen any consequences at home, he's never, he's always been requested, never been told uh, or ordered what to do. Then imagine now this same child is uh, reading the Quran. And I'm not saying it's going to be like that for everybody. Some people, they, maybe they may feel that, okay, I never had that. And this is like, uh, I wish I had that. But in general, like you're going to be, you know, uh, accustomed to that. So you you realize that there's, there is an, is a hierarchy. And naturally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be at the very top of that hierarchy. Yeah, they get faced with... Uh, Otherwise, some people, they have, they, they get this shuck like, uh, oh, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throw people in, in the hellfire? It's like now when you see what's happening in, in Gaza, you realize why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would. I mean, it's it's very clear. No. Yeah, subhanAllah. So, so going back, I think to, although we drifted uh, away, um, but alhamdulillah, yani, inshallah, ikun fi khir. But to go back to the the, the idea of uh, Muslim scholarship and the, the I, I believe what's going on right now, and it, it, it didn't help at all, is the advent of uh, the internet, the advent of social media, this concept of having followers. Um, I believe before an imam or a sheikh used to go to a masjid, right? Uh, you'd give a khutbah, you'd give your talk, and then you would simply leave, and whoever liked it, liked it. Whoever didn't like it, didn't like it, and that what that was it. Today, there are many things that you have to, There are there's a laundry list of things that you have to keep in mind before giving a lecture. You're not just, you're not, as a public speaker, you're not just going to, I mean, it should be, but today it's become so common, you're not just going to go to any given masjid or conference and say what you're going to say because now you have everybody recording, everybody sees it on social media, and now you have to keep in mind that organization that invited me last year. Okay, I got a feminist alliance. Okay, they're not going to like me. I got an alliance with the LGBT community. Um, okay, well, they're not going to like me either. So now you start your message literally uh, looks like this. It's supposed to look like this. I don't, that's not, not that's not an appropriate sign, is it? Okay, let me do this. Because I think there's like in the music industry, they do this or something yeah. like that. Anyways, <laughs> let's just assume your, your khutbah is supposed to look like this. After, after doing all of these revisions and editing everyone and keeping everybody in mind because you don't want to lose out on these alliances, your message goes from this to now it's like this. It's completely, mm -hmm. as you mentioned earlier, Sheikh Asadullah, it's distorted. It's misconstrued, it's decontextualized, it's different than your basic halal and haram. You know, that's the job of each and every sheikh, is to try to get his congregation as close as he can to Allah's pleasure and to remove them and distance them from Allah's wrath. In essence, that's kind of what it all boils down to. Yeah, and I mean, when that's why I mentioned in the in sort of in the introduction that the new generation, they're getting this warped version of the message as opposed to what their forefathers were getting, or parents even, where the imam would come and yeah. he would say what he knew the community needed to hear, as opposed to now the imam stands there, and it's not what the community needs to hear. It's that, um, you know, the whole world is listening to me, and I need to keep all, you know, I'm not worried about my little community and, you know, their needs and, you know, their spiritual rectification, but I have to be careful about all of these other things. And in the process of that, it becomes sort of a, a fear of makhluq, and uh, you forget that in reality, it should just be a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, uh, I know in Surah Al-Ahzab, there's a, there's a lot of discussion around, uh, you can't, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's different tafsirs for that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is implying there, according to some of the mufassirun, that Allah that didn't give you two hearts so that you can have fear of Allah ta'ala and fear of makhluq on the other side. He's giving you one heart and you have to fill it with the fear of Allah. The, the surah starts, Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu taqillah wa la tuta'il kafirin wa al-munafiqin. And there's ayat throughout the surah. So I guess it becomes a, a, that becomes a really big pitfall for a lot of, you know, as you mentioned for the du'at and for the community leaders and, and ulama. And, and I, again, maybe to, to piggyback off of what you said, uh, I believe we, and this is, this is one of the reasons, this is like one of the mafasid, right? So, so for example, a lot of people are looking for a maslaha. They're saying, look, we're being silent on ABC subject because for a greater maslaha. Uh, and, and every time you look at that maslaha, there is an overarching mafsada. That's literally, literally, wallahi, right above it, right? So mm -hmm. you're trying to be silent on subject A, not realizing that you have a mafsada that's 10 times the size of that ma ma maslaha that you're trying to secure and gain. Okay, so yeah. is there just a question for both of you? Is there a bigger mafsada 
than an average Muslim who looks at a practicing Muslim. And because they're doing the very basic minimums of Islam, and they look at that person and say, wow, they're extreme because they pray five times a day and they wear hijab. Do you know how we got there? It's not overnight. And it's mm. not spontaneously. We got there after years and years and years of being selective and cherry picking our messages and the way we deliver these messages. And this is why you have what we have uh, uh, today. Yeah, yeah right. I've seen, I've seen uh, you know, uh, people from uh, houses that uh, wherein the parents pray five times a day. And, uh, you know, if you mention, for example, that, uh, you know, uh, homosexuality is wrong, right? Then they immediately get defensive. They're like, why are you being so judgmental? Just let them live their lives, you know? Uh, you know, if they're not hurting you, why does it, you know, why does it matter? And like you said, uh, this is all a symptom of, uh, of of basically not speaking on these topics. You know, yes. speaking, sometimes people, they think that, okay, as long as I don't lie, I don't say something wrong, uh, it's okay. But it's not the case. It's like you have biryani. I don't know from your country what kind of food uh, you probably have biryani it. I love biryani. If it's cooked the right way, I'm all in. I'm all in. Yes. So like, you know, in biryani, you just put, uh, it needs a lot of different things. You can't, you can't make up for the, uh, for the lack of salt by putting extra, uh, you know, extra masala. So everything needs its proportions. And if you take one thing away, uh, you're going to come up with a, with a different, uh, a, a different uh, food. It's going to be khuskhus without, without the masala, you know? <laughs> and, and you'd no longer, no, 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 really. And you, you can no longer, see, that's the thing is I believe we're, we're see, you, you have, you have somewhat of a shape, right? You have Islam as, as a shape. I yeah. think we're at a point where we're, we've kind of rubbed over the skin, like the body, you rubbed over the skin. Now you're beyond the skin, right? You're into the, 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 not the bone, but right after the skin, you have that layer and then you have the, 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 the meat and so on and so forth. We have literally carved so much out where the only thing that's left is the structure, like the skeletal part. Mm. And we're still trying to convince people. Yeah, that's Islam too. It's only so much that you can change until you, now you start to, ha you have to call it something else. As yeah. you mentioned earlier, right? If you add, or if you take out, if you're going to add too much, if you're going to cut it's like water and everything other liquids you well yeah we can no longer call this coffee this is more appropriately water with a, a, a tad bit of of tint to it right and yeah. that's the thing i think with islam you can't you can't change so much and still look at it and say oh yeah that's that's normative islam yeah. and this by the way this is leading people right again you're trying to secure a benefit right but at the same time when you, your selectivity is leading a lot of muslims to allah's wrath they're not doing the very basics and you're not telling them that they abandoning these very basic duties is leading them to hell, yeah. right? And this concept of, by the way, being judgmental, um, we all judge. I, I don't get this idea of, you know what, um, we all judge. People are judging us right now. They're judging the, the your room, uh, Asadullah, Sheikh Asadullah. They're judging your room. Uh, they're judging, mashallah, the, the bookshelf of uh, Sheikh Musab, right? They're judging our content, the way we speak. The, the, every, they're judging everything, right? Are we going to now call them judgmental creeps? No, this is the way Allah created us, right? Mm. We have the way to judge. We have the right to judge people, to say that what you're doing is haram. But I don't have the right to say that you are for surety going to hell. But I can, and we can say for surety, without a shadow of a doubt, that for example, not praying does lead right to hell. Yeah. And the for same example, way that praying, praying five times a day leads right to Jannah. It, that thing leads to Jannah. But I, I'm not going to say for surety that you're going to Jannah because you're praying to five, because there are so many other factors and variables that we are not aware of. And it's Allah ultimately who uh, judges. Uh, Sheikh mm -hmm. Musab Afwan. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was saying that, you know, like Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu taqullah wa kunu ma'asadiqeen. The oh, you who believe, fear Allah and be with those who are, you know, truthful. So how can you be with, uh, you know, the the ones who are truthful if you don't judge, if you don't filter out the ones who are not truthful, right? So. Um, and it's a part. It's a part of. Uh, I hope I'm not. Yeah. I hope I'm not being repetitive here, but um, you know what's funny is when people say, "Oh, are you to judge me?" It's it's funny that um, when you compliment someone, you're judging them. Yeah. Like yep. if I were to say, Sheikh Musab, you look very handsome. You're a handsome man. You're not, you're, you're not, you're never going to look at me and say, who are you to judge me? You don't know what's in my heart. And the reason <laughs> being is because your heart likes that. Your ego likes that. Your ego is saying, I want to hear more. What else can you compliment me on? Mm -hmm. Right? So, but when it comes in the form of criticism, the ego gets all tense and now it's looking to divert attention and, you know, it, it's looking to blame someone else. Right. That and that's why. 
the axe swings both, I said the axe swings both ways. Like you can't just take the compliments and reject the criticism. But you know what's what's worrisome is when you hear some very prominent duha use that word, and it wallahi, it makes me I feel I get I get um I feel a sense of despair when I see some huge grand sheikh <laughs> say, you know, we shouldn't judge other people. I mean you sound like a typical 12 year old who's not we're not knocking people down but what do you mean who are we to i mean that, that that's a simplistic saying that you know you would say in your teens but as a sheikh as an alim as a, as a da'i you, well what do we mean by this idea of who are we to judge can we judge can we not judge and so on and so forth right mm. yeah no very interesting uh you want to go uh, with the next question Musab? Yeah, go ahead. You can ask, ask the questions. Inshallah. So <clears throat> earlier we mentioned that our up and coming generations have grown up with a warped understanding of the truth. So from your experience, are there other negative consequences that you've seen when Muslims shy away from speaking the truth? And I think we've touched on some of this as already. But are there any particular experiences where you can say that, you know, we're starting to see in our generation, these are examples of where, you know, if the if, if the the leaders were doing their job, we wouldn't see these certain issues. Are there any examples of that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think we did talk. I think we kind of got a bit of uh, ahead of ourselves earlier. But yeah. uh, the, the, one of the main examples, I believe, has to do with just the, the basic minimums. Like when you offer the basic minimums, um, another person who doesn't offer them feels like you and them. You guys are just identical you're just one and the same you know don't think that you're going to jannah because you pray and because you know and don't think that i'm going to hell because i don't pray and i don't wear hijab you know what mm -hmm. we're you know it's the heart that counts yeah this is just it's it's distorted it's a huge distortion it's a lie it's the least it's kadib it's khida it's dajal right in all of its forms so that's why and as sarahatan and my message to the du dua has always been Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning the average Muslim. The way we're doing it, the way we've been doing it, is corrupting a lot of young Muslims, especially, especially, especially the Muslim women. Like mm. topics that have to do with women are completely off the table, right? And it is said that if you want to know who controls everything and who you're afraid of these are the people you can't speak of i mean today when it comes to women's issues that's like a red line it's it's something that you don't even dare get close to right and, it's and again having consequences in marriages and a lot of other you know parts of uh, our lives as well no no 100 percent one and again that basically comes off with the cherry picking the being selective and not you know having a balance when it comes to holding people accountable so i believe for the past 15 20 years we've been talking to muslim men for example about their uh duties and responsibilities but when we can't talk to women we're talking to them about their um uh their uh their rights we're talking to women about their rights and we're pandering to them and um you know when it comes to accountability uh and uh, responsibility that's completely off the table and i believe wallahi this in itself is destroying a lot of good muslim women out there who have the potential to be better but they're constantly being comforted and it's exactly this comfort that's destroying them inside out subhanallah and it's making them unhappy <laughs> Well, and again, that's what happens. Right? That's what we said earlier, right? When you when you tweak that, when you completely change it, and you believe you have a better way of reaching out to humanity instead of keeping things balanced, this is the result you're going to get. You, it's going to backfire sooner than later. Subhanallah. Now, so um, the next question we had, we said that many Muslim leaders would like to speak the truth in all circumstances. However, they find themselves vulnerable to a myriad of factors. What does Islam teach us in terms of modeling our life so that we can tolerate the possible consequences of speaking the truth? How do we insulate ourselves? How do we protect ourselves such that we, we have built ourselves in such a way that we become impervious to the pressures that are trying to hold us back from speaking the truth? And this is and something this, that was uh, asking if he wants to add more context to the question. Yeah, and this this might be not necessary. It can it can have multiple dimensions, right? Like one is a spiritual dimension and one is like a logistical dimension. Like how do you actually, uh, you know, curate your life? 
here, I'm not I'm not going to sit here and lie to anyone and say that I have all the answers. However, I think there are certain things that are obvious and it, it has to be somewhat of a minimum for any average uh, day or for any, any given uh, day, Muslim imam or, or Shia. Um, here's the thing. You, you have to understand that sometimes certain things that you're silent on could mean punishment for the person who's looking for you to speak. Okay, I'll just give one example. So, for example, you can't say it's a hikmah for me. It's a hikmah for me not to speak about hijab because I don't want to turn the sisters away from the masjid, for example. Right. I don't want to come off judgmental. There are bigger things to worry about. And of course, shaitan is going to give you a myriad, a long list as to why you shouldn't talk about it. And yes, you're going to be convinced it's not of wisdom because obviously you don't deep inside. You don't want to talk about it because you know there's going to be backlash. You know there's going to be criticism uh, lingering around the corner. Okay, so your nefs already doesn't want to talk about it. So you're convinced it's not of wisdom. Now is not the right time, and so on and so forth. Okay. However, the problem though, it, you're not in a remote village where it stops there. You have the average Muslim sister who's being bombarded by hundreds of voices out there telling her that hijab is simply a matter of culture. Hijab is just something that you do, you know, when you're going to the masjid. That's just part of customs. It's just part of culture. It's not mandatory. It's not wajib, right? Okay, well, what do you do now? When a lot of these sisters on one side, you're completely silent, right? You're not saying a word. Zip, zil, shnada, not a scintilla. You're silent, okay? But at the same time, the average Muslim sister is hearing from a lot of enemies of Islam who are talking about hijab, of course, with this very savvy, um, uh, uh, overdeveloped language, academic language. And she thinks and says, well, life, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, she might have been even considering wearing the hijab. But now that she listened to a lot of this rhetoric after one speech, after TED, TEDx, after this speech, after this speech on YouTube, and it goes on and on, she decides, you know what? She's convinced now hijab is simply a cultural matter. And a lot of the Muslim women who have been wearing hijab for thousands of, for hundreds of years, they've Basically, they've been duped uh, and the wool has been pulled over their, 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 their heads. But you're convinced that, oh, it's a hikmah for me to be silent, mm. right? And this is one of the topics, again, that you're, you're, the Muslim women are thirsty to hear, you know, the, the hijab. I mean, the hijab has been sexified. It's been objectified. It's been exploited. It's been turned into, it's been turned into Allahu alam what, what it's been turned into. And you guys all know this, right? Mm. Um but who's talking about this? So when is that young Muslim sister going to say, oh, I heard this lecture. You know, I don't think it's befitting for a Muslim woman to do this online or to wear hijab and do this instead. But you you can't you you can't just say it's of hikmah that I'm doing this when in reality mm. you're I, I find it to be deception. You're lying to the people you're supposed to help. Right. What about and what about and I know this question is coming, but we might as well just ask it now since we're, we're in this. Um, what about the concept of uh, tadrij? You know, like uh, leveling up to the uh, to the truth. Because mm. where you know where is a person genuinely doing proper tadrij, and where is mm -hmm. a person you know just like kind of deceiving themselves? Um, this is this is where I and again I don't know if we're talking about the receiving end or the giver. Are you talking about the the dai the sheikh, or are we talking about just the the individual? Uh, I was thinking from the uh, the dai's or both. Let's say both. I guess we can. We okay. Let's say both. Okay. No, that's a very good question because this is, I believe, one of the uh, masalik of shaitan as well. Is that shaitan will yeah. convince you that bitta daruj. So you'll find a da'i who's been given. You know, uh, he's been in a certain position for twenty years. He never talked about hijab. He never talked about a woman obeying her husband. But he's still convinced that okay, it's the daruj. I mean, are you telling me this man is going to come after thirty years and say, okay, jamaat al khair? There are twenty topics that I've been meaning to talk to you guys for talk to you about for the past 20 years but now all of you are spiritually mature so here it is are you ready no <laughs> that moment it, never it, comes. Ne it never happens yeah it never happens so i think we're we're kidding ourselves i don't want to say we're lying to ourselves but i think we're kidding ourselves because in theory in theory it sounds good it's music to the ears but it's not it's not applicable like in it's not tellable it's tenable and it's not applicable mm -hmm. and it's something that no one frankly no one does so the idea of tadarruj, it's very different because I also get this also kind of as a uh, as a rebut is people will say, Bashir, you have to take your audience slowly. Okay, your audience is going to be a mixture. You're going to have uh, people who are at the very beginning of their journey, people who are, are in the middle of their journey, 
people who are uh, three quarters way uh, to their journey, people who are at the end of their journey, right? So you, you're not going to be able to do that. It's, yeah. it's, it's sound. There's tadarush when you're dealing with certain people. With When you're dealing with a new Muslim, yes, you want to do tadarush. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't want to give them all of the ahkam. that could be quite overwhelming and it could definitely be a turnoff. Um, now, when we're talking with a general congregation, let, let's take example of hijab. Right. Because this is the, and again, I'm convinced it has nothing to do. You're, you're you don't want to talk about it because you know what awaits you. Bottom line. OK, mm -hmm. listen, let's just all be frank and real with one another. Don't give me that. It's of wisdom, brother. I know it's been 10 mm -hmm. years and I'm trying to take it slowly with the community. Listen, you don't want to talk about it. You and I know what's up. Okay, let's just leave that there. Okay, um, let's talk about hijab. You have the average Muslim girl today grows up. Her mother probably wears hijab. Her grandmother probably wears hijab. Her aunties probably wear hijab. Her The pictures she's seen growing up of her family back home or of her grand grandma. I mean, the hijab is up. It's, she's seen it all over the place. Yet we're telling ourselves, oh, no, that's a little bit too much because we're in the Meccan period. <laughs> Listen, I, I I can't get down with this. I can't tolerate this. I, I believe this is, again, this is Dajjal. What do you mean? Yeah. So what about, okay, what about the other sisters who are wearing hijab? You're telling me they don't need, see, this is the problem. We take one testimony of a sister who complained of a sheikh. Yeah. A sheikh gave a, by the way, it's a very good friend of mine. He's a doctor. He gave a uh, khutbah about hijab. It was a basic khutbah. Qala Allah, qala Rasul. Nothing special at all. So this lady was on the board, right? And she said, oh, we can't have this guy come back here anymore. He's never going to give the khutbah anymore. We have to do a better job at venting our speakers and so on and so forth, right? Basically, it's as if she's there to make sure that no one talks about women's issues. Mm. Literally, right? Anyways, but my problem is, okay, you have one girl who got out of the masjid because she felt like the khita, the khatib was judgmental, although the khatib probably does it know anything about that that sister right she leaves she decides it was judgmental she's never coming back to the masjid and the the imam or the board they get wind of that so now they believe they have to okay she thought it was her judgmental could it very well be that maybe she's the problem after all could it be that maybe she's egotistical could it be could it be that maybe she's very full of herself could it be that she has such a big ego that it doesn't really matter who's going to come and give her nasiha she's simply too full of herself is it possible that she needs to do work on herself before any kind of spiritual journey or any spiritual improvement right so why are we always constantly blaming the khatib oh because he was passionate because he was loud, because he said it this way or that way. Okay, that's one thing. Number two, what happens to the testimony of the sister who comes to you and says, Sheikh, I don't know what to say. I May Allah reward you. Thank you for talking about the hijab. I've been coming to this masjid for five, ten years. No one has ever given a khutbah about the hijab and what the proper hijab is. Dear Sheikh, we women who are wearing the proper hijab, we need reinforcement too. Who speaks to those women? Are you telling me, Billahi alaykum, are you guys honest? Are you, are you, uh, Mashayikh, are you telling me that these women don't need re reinforcement? I mean, Allah says to Prophet Muhammad, Oh Muhammad, if we didn't give you strength, you would, you, kitta, right? You, you could have, right? It's to, lean or given in to them a bit, right? So, mana illa bashar, we're human beings. The world doesn't revolve around the one sister who doesn't want to wear the proper hijab. There are other women out there who need solidifying, who need solidarity, who need to be reinforced, who need to be told, sister, what you're doing is not easy. What you're doing, only a select few women can do in today's age. May Allah reward you. Keep on the path. Your reward with Allah is immense. Where is this speech for these women? Why are we so focused and zoomed in and super duper fixated on the women who don't want to, You don't want to wear hijab. That's between you and Allah. But don't come to us expecting us and the board to not talk about hijab because you don't like it when we talk about hijab. And that may even Literally. be the better path toward in tadarruj where you build the ones who are doing it and you build them and you build them and you strengthen them and then others will find, uh, you know, what do you call it? Uh, inspiration from that group. Yeah. And, and a lot of times what happens is instead of the message you were saying, the message is, to those sisters that hey don't think uh that you're better than someone else because of what you're wearing yeah. you know that's yeah. usually what it is so it's it's completely twisted and you know so it's like it, it has the vibes of uh you know where you're mm -hmm. uh you know you're preferring you're so uh, eager for these people who have you know who, who who are worshiping their own ego 
uh, to accept Islam or maybe they're already Muslim, but to accept the orders of Allah in totality, that you're ignoring the one who is uh, You know, that person truly sincerely wants tazkiyah. You know, they want to purify themselves, uh, but, you know, because of, uh, you know, our over eagerness for the other person, we're ignoring them. They're thirsty, they're ready, they're receptive, they're coachable, they're all of the above. Allahum, they yeah. need reinforcement too. This is the whole point. They, and again, you guys are, uh, I keep saying you guys, I think it's the uh, my Anglo Saxon, no, <laughs> my European, hey guys, uh, <laughs> forgive me. Um, and again, what we talked about the very beginning is that this is what happens in, when we lose the balance. When we don't keep things balanced, you're going to mm. have problems like this. Right now, what if now can you imagine? Does someone ever tell that sister, like, sister, just out of curiosity, can, can we be honest? Sure. Has it ever occurred to you that maybe you're the problem and you've been the problem all along? Maybe has it maybe the problems with you that anybody tells you something that you don't like, you dismiss it as being aggressive, they lacked wisdom. Oh, that wasn't the right time. We have bigger fridge to find. In other words, anytime there's something that comes their way that they don't like of criticism, they dismiss it with an excuse. No one's ever going to come to you and say, hey, Jazakallah khair for the lecture. I just want to let you know about something about myself. I hate the truth. No one will ever say that. Yeah. Right? But shaitan is going to comfort us thinking that we have all these legitimate reasons just so it doesn't make us look bad. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. so um, one, other, one other thing like on this, uh, you know, on this point of modeling our life so that we can tolerate consequences, right? Um, going back to that point. Uh, one thing, one thing that I was personally thinking of is, like you know, we have so many stories of uh, of ulama in the uh, ulama in the past uh, who would go above and beyond to make sure they're not relying financially, uh, they're not hooked. Allahu over. Akbar. Yeah. Amazing, amazing point. Afwan. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, like uh, living a life where you know where you're not taking the wrong kind of money. Number one, and also living a life of simplicity. Like even if you do have, let's say, halal money. Uh, let's say you take a lot of that, you know, you you expand your life um, to live, uh, you know, to live uh, too luxuriously. But then, you know, like the higher you go, the harder you fall. So uh, if hard time, hard times come, uh, like you, you want to make sure, like in al that min al iman, right? Like simplicity is from iman. The more simple life you live, the more minimalistic you are in your life. Even though it's not haram to live luxuriously if you have the means. But it'll, right. it'll give you more of an uh, uh, an ability to speak the truth in hard times. I I think um, I I don't know how I missed that, but I believe that's probably the the bedrock of everything else. I think that's the trunk of the tree. Um, is is when you're when your when your mouth or your tongue is tied to a paycheck or tied to a board member or an organization, it becomes very very difficult. You're you're it's as if you're you're trying to fly free. Right. But you're in a cage. You're, yeah, you have you have a jurisdiction that you have to stay within. Right. Uh, and that's I think that's what happens when you're tied down to a board into a masjid. A person truly either two situations, either they can have their finances completely away from da'wah if they can, or they allow the board is going to allow that person to run that masjid. He is the one who's running that masjid. Not a doctor, not a scientist, not a um not an engineer. No, no, no. It's the person who went to school to study. That's the person who's running that masjid. He is the one who dictates what's halal and what's haram, what's to be spoken of, what's to be dismissed, and so on and so forth. Um, that's, that's I think, the trickiest part because a lot of the imams today, they're, they're ditching imama. They're ditching the imama. They're looking for other jobs because, the, first off, the pay is sometimes it's not enough. And second is you feel like you're, you're, you're treated as if you're a second-class citizen. Um, and you're the one who's being told what to do and what not to do and so on and so forth. Um, yes. So I, I believe funds is very, very important. If you can have independent uh, your finances, if you can have financial independence in that regard, then you don't have to worry about, oh, if I say this, they're going to fire me. If I say this lecture, they're going to let me go. If I don't say this, they're not going to invite me to next year's event. And I'm really counting on that because of my bills or because of whatever I got going on. So if you can remain remain financially independent, Yanni, you can say whatever it is you want to say. Now, we're not for being careless, by the way. I don't want someone watching us thinking we're all about being careless and just speaking whatever and not being considerate of people's opinions or people's feelings. No, no one is. Listen, we're all about wisdom. 
Okay, we're all about wisdom, but we're, I think we're we're all in agreement that we're not with the way the, uh, the the way things have been modeled, at least for the past maybe twenty years in America, in terms of the the Dawa. Yeah, people, I think, should understand that there is a real problem. Uh, we're not just uh, yelling about some made up issue, but these are actually things where what I feel like everything I've been trained to say and do is I'm not allowed to say and do it, basically. And I think both of you uh, highlighted two of the important factors in terms of uh, insulating oneself. Uh, Sheikh Susi, you mentioned uh, the spiritual, kind of the spiritual aspect of it, which is that you should keep in mind in your heart that am I doing good to this person or am I doing bad to this person? You know, by telling them what they want to hear as opposed to what they need to hear. And uh, Habiz Musab mentioned um, the point about, you know, just keeping yourself um, financially independent or accustoming, uh, you know, customizing yourself to, you know, probably a little more of a um, simple lifestyle, if you, if need be, or independence, complete in, independence in terms of your uh, that. Well, those are, I think, uh, very important, very key things. Um, but I think <clears throat> there was one question that's related to that, and then we'll kind of segue into a more specific uh, topic uh, afterwards. And that was basically that Muslims understand that Islam does not burden us with more than we can bear. Given that the truth often leads to political and social consequences, does Islam put a limitation on what we are expected to bear? Like, where where do we have, where can we say that this is a legitimate excuse to not speak the truth? I guess you can mm -hmm. say in terms of political pressure or social pressure. And, and what and can to, we say uh, that is ma'lud in that sense? And to elaborate on this point a little bit more, you have consequences that are just social, like you're not going to, uh, you know, like Imam uh, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal rahmatullahi, he went to jail, he was lashed. Those are legal political consequences, right? Uh, from the state, but then there are social consequences where you're not fearing any of the you know the above, but you're fearing a backlash, repercussions from people. Which can any of these be an urdur? Oh boy, uh, that's a that's a profound that's a profound question. And when it comes to the um, when it co comes to the social aspect, I, I can't I can't think of a of course to every for every general rule maybe there's an exception but generally speaking if it's a matter of you're afraid of not being liked I don't find this to be a legitimate excuse in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, because a lot of people again they're being misguided due to your silence your silence is misguiding other people so I have no idea how that could be other in front of Allah um, the other thing as well is when we're talking about the social pressures especially with the advent of social media right where it's about likes it's about sharing it's about clout it's about popularity right and not all of them and I'm not saying all of it but for the most part this is kind of what how things kind of have been uh, forming, if you will. So when it comes to that, being like ma making sure that I want to be invited, right? Uh, I want to be liked by everybody. I don't want to be the person who's known to rock the boat. I just want to be that cool Muslim under the united banner. And hey, you know what? We just have to overlook one another and so on and so forth. As, as that, that as a other, I, I don't think that that's a other. Now, in terms of it being on the political, the political sphere or the political side, there are certain things that yes you have to use wisdom right okay you're um, for example you're a muslim day uh it's 2023 we know how the world views you know islam right you want to be careful with your words you because you know in that congregation you probably have certain cia agents you might have fbi agents you might have the mossad right these are all realities that no one should completely negate out there however at the same time what is it that you're saying that the FBI is going to take and say, okay, we really need to lock this guy up. You're not, yani, anta mat nas al -al -khuruj, for example, right? Mm -hmm. You're not enticing the American people to lift arms against the uh, against the American government, right? No one is doing this. It's just, it's simply very uh, controversial topics that within us Muslims, they were never controversial, right? They became controversial, right? So mm -hmm. if there's things, yes, I mean, for example, in certain Muslim countries, right? Now, I don't want to get into the discussion of the Muslim rulers and non-Muslim, because I know this really just, it, for us, it doesn't do nothing for me, at least in my own household and for the typical Muslim right now. It's not going to do anything, okay? Yes. Um, and that discussion really gets heated and you end up two people on the side of the fence. But if certain things, 
where you believe that your your body is going to be thrown in a dungeon and you're going to be basically you're going to be in the past tense then maybe one could say okay okay because that person might but if we're looking in today's you want to do you want to translate that in english uh which one i'm sorry uh, you know, that person, he may have an excuse. Yeah, that person might might have an excuse, right? That person might have an excuse, a legitimate excuse. It's just for the audience, because I think we use the word other so many times. I want, I uh, hope people aren't missing the, the point. I sent him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, other would be like a legitimate a legitimate excuse yeah. in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, however, though, there are certain, uh, for examples, uh, there are certain there's a hadith that comes to mind with Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu where he says, he says, حَفِظْتُمَ الرَّسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وِعَعَيْنِ أَمَّا أَحَدُهُمَا فَقَدْ بَثَثْتُهُ وَأَمَّا الْآخَرُ فَلَوْ بَثَثْتُهُ لَقُطِعَ هَذَا الْبِلْعُ He says, I've memorized two vessels of knowledge from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. One vessel I've transmitted, I've conveyed to people. One vessel, if I were to transmit it to the people, my, my throat would be slit. In other words, I would be put to death. Okay, mm -hmm. and this had to do with things that had to do with politics. So he remained he remained silent in that regard. But look here, though, him remaining silent on the Khulafa of the future, who's going to be the Khalifa in Bani Fulan and Bani Fulan? Does that affect the spirituality of the average Muslim? No. Mm -hmm. So for him to remain silent on that regard, it doesn't affect mm -hmm. the halal or the haram of the average Muslim. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, in another in another hadith, we find uh, it's a very popular hadith of Mu'adh um, ibn uh, Jabal radiyallahu anhu, right? When the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam says, tell the people that whomever says la ilaha illallah, you know, wa ahad al jidar, whomever says la ilaha illallah, and these are his last words, they will be admitted to paradise. Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu at the end of his life, he was reluctant to say this and to convey this message to people because he didn't want people to simply rely on that word on simply saying it and then they will be uh, they will abandon the deeds so he was reluctant to say this hadith because he didn't want people to simply rely on the hadith on the uh, on the verse of the kalima right and completely abandon the the hadith so there are certain times yes uh, there's also a story of abdullah ibn abbas radiallahu anhu right it's a common story where a man came to him about uh, uh, qatil, the repentance of someone who killed someone, right? He came to one, one person asked him, and Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu said, Laka tawbah. Yes, you can make tawbah. Another person came to him asking him about the tawbah of the qatil, the person who killed someone else, right? He says, Laysa laka tawbah. Now he gave one, you don't one have, question. You don't have tawbah. Yeah, you, you don't get toba. So one person, he said yes, and the other person says, no, you don't get uh, toba. Toba is not open for you. Now, Abdullah bin Abbas, radiallahu anhu, su'il, he was asked later on, why this person you said, yes, he has a toba, and this person, he said, no. He said, he said, mm -hmm. this person who came asking if he could repent after killing, I told him no, because I saw the evil in his eye. The other person truly came repentant and he wanted to repent. And this is why I said, yes, you have the, the doors of Tawbah are open for you. Right. So we have to carefully gauge what's of hikmah. What's, so, for example, yes, when you're first meeting a crowd, you don't want to talk to them about something controversial. You want to leave these controversial subjects for a later date. If you're coming to a lecture, they don't know you. You don't know them. You're an imam. You, you don't, you, yes, you want to be gradual with them. You don't want to. Your first khutbah doesn't want to be about, you know, a woman's obedience to her husband, for example. <laughs> Right. So th there is a place and time for it. But I think the problem that we have today in American Dawah is that we've completely abused because the istithna is al-kitman. Al-asl fi dawah tabliq. wal istithna huwa al-kitman. The asl in dawah is to convey the message. Right. Ya ayyu al-rasulu balligh ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. So the essential job of the, uh, the job description of Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is to convey the message. That's the asl, that's the foundation. The exception of the rule is to keep certain things when truly there is wisdom that lies within it. But mm -hmm. we have, today we've done the complete opposite. The asl becomes the kitman, right? And the istithna becomes the uh, the, the, the given of the ta'wa. Allah And, and, and one, one last point on this, uh, you know, the fatwa would be, you know, for the ulama 
uh, that let's say there is you know a, a big risk to life or something like that okay they would have an udhr but even in that situation we find ulama in the past who uh you know adopted taqwa right they adopted taqwa and they were ready to uh the azima the azima yes so yeah subhanallah yeah and for uh, even at the time of Imam Ahmad ibn Hamal radiallahu anhu, there were other imams who did not stay firm with, you know, you have yeah. Imam uh, Ibn Nuh, I believe it was with Imam Ahmad, but mm. uh, excuse me, others did not, um, others did not, they were not as firm as Imam Ahmad and so on. But looking at the caliber of Imam Ahmad, that's why it's important when you have a lot of clout, when you have a lot of followers, you're going to be asked about that on Yom al Qiyamah. Right, to whom much is given, much is expected. Um, a, a lot of times, يعني, because Imam Ahmad, يعني, he's not like any other random person. Imam Ahmad is Imam Ahmad. What he says, it's it's binding. What he says, people are going to take it and they're going to run with it. So he can't just say whatever he wants just to kind of get away with it, right? He can't just use what Ammar ibn Yasser used, right? This is because This is not your average. This is Al Imam Ahmed. What he says, the rest of the Ummah is going to follow. Yeah. Sheikh said, you want to segue into the next question? Okay, I'll go ahead and. Uh... Uh, okay. Sorry, I have a. I think there's a connection issue or something. It's no, it's awesome. okay. You're good now. Yeah, sorry about that. So, sorry, um, should we go to the next question or? Yes, inshallah. Yeah. So, okay, so, so I, I know we're about to segue, and uh, I, I'm so sorry, but uh, I, I, there was one question that I, it was just on my mind for for like the last few hours, and I, I have to ask it. So, in terms of holding. Um, the people who are responsible of speaking the truth, uh, what is the way to hold, right way to hold them accountable if they're not doing that? I think accountability, you spoke about it, you mentioned it. So what is the way to do that? I The same thing, the same thing I told, um, I was asked this question in Seattle just two weeks ago and I told the congregations, I said, listen, it is your job, it is your duty, that is your job and that is your duty for you all to speak to the religious leader, to the imam, to the to the to the imam or to the sheikh, and to tell them that you guys want to hear other topics. You guys want you know you want to hear about okay, hell. You guys want to hear about that Allah has aziz dun tiqam. You guys want to hear about the other side. So it's the job of the congregation, right? The only and again this goes back to the message of accountability and responsibility. First is for us to acknowledge that we've drifted away very far away. Now it is our job and it is only we, us ourselves, who can get ourselves back at, at shore. Right. So I think it's a communal obligation. Um, mm. Subhanallah. So I'm gonna go into the next question. Uh since we're all running over time, inshallah. So we can uh, we'll try to close off with this question, inshallah, before we let uh Sheikh go. No, I'm good. I'm good. Hayakum Allah. I'm, I'm, go, go on. I'm, I'm good, inshallah. Hayakum Allah. Okay, inshallah. So it has been over three months now that uh, innocent people of Gaza have been under a brutal bombardment and experiencing untold suffering, not to mention the decades-long siege. Many Muslims have found their voices and taken to the streets demanding ceasefires and aid for the oppressed Muslims of Gaza. We also know that honor and help come from Allah Ta'ala based on both what we say and do. Is there a fear that we're talking the talk publicly, but falling short of walking the walk privately, the doing part? Could you, some, could you shed some light on the impact of our day-to-day -day actions on the conditions that befall us as an ummah? So basically, one is that we are now speaking up on this issue, but, you know, Sidq also has to be exp uh, expressed through our a'mal as well. And um, there seems to be a disconnect. And what role is that disconnect playing in the ahwal that are befalling the ummah? Wallahi, you've asked, this is, I mean, this literally needs a, a muhadara or a lecture independently on its own, simply because <laughs> there is a lot. Uh, when I say a lot, there is a lot uh, to cover. Akhi, wallahi, I don't know where to start when it comes to this, simply because um, when this first happened, Muslims, when they talk about victory, when they talk about izzah, when they talk about these noble concepts that I think we're all thirsty for, um, 
a lot of Muslims have a different opinion. You know, you have the, the extreme Sufis who are going to come to you and say, oh, no, no, brother, you know what? This is all the Qadr of Allah. We just, we just have to kind of look from afar and allow it to happen. The Ikhwan al-Muslimin, our brothers, the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, I mean, they are our brothers after all. Um, they believe that the only way to any of this, for any of this to get better, for any kind of healing, it's for us to simply uh, uh, approach it through the diplomatic way. Now, you have the Salafis, Ikhwanuna, uh, the, the Salaf, they believe yani, that, no, the only way that this is going to get better is for each and every Muslim to rectify him or herself. Well, and, and if you were to honestly look at uh, the, the, the Salaf, yes, we have to rectify ourselves. Now, when you look at the brothers, the Ikhwan and Muslimin, if you will, they're, they're seeking things the political way. But to say that it's done one specific way, it's not. I think the big error happens is when Muslims are banking solely and primarily on the political process. I find this to be nauseating. I find it to be nuts. I find it to be ludicrous. And I find it to be very, very misleading. And, and it goes against the sunan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the sunan, they have the sunan and nasr, there are ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about victory, uh, how to attain victory, how to attain izzah, how to attain yani, the, the, the sarifah that the Muslim ummah once had. And some brothers are adamant today that it's only through the political system. And what they mean by that is they'll say it is through having a larger lobby than what APAC currently has. It is only through that means. And I Allah, may Allah forgive them. I believe the political process is but a means. It is a tool. It is a way. It is secondary, perhaps even after that. And the primary thing where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly bestows his izza and nasr upon us is when we collectively turn back to him and repent and we rectify ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while at the same time, using the political process that we have disposable because we don't have any other process uh, given to us, we can use that, right? We could supplement it and they can go hand in hand. The problem is a lot of Muslim, your average Muslim today, unfortunately, is looking at the political process as the be all and the end all. And this is very, very problematic. Yeah. You know, when it comes to getting out of situations like this and um, um, we tend to forget about our own a'mal, like you mentioned, people are hyper fixated on the political process and rightfully they should, they should do that. But in terms of their own personal a'mal, like what about salah? What about these things upon which the Quran time and again tells us that your success and all of that is dependent on your salah? Like uh, I remember one of our teachers was giving, he made a beautiful point actually, and ironically it was about the Jews, uh, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salatu wasalam after, you know, Fir'aun did to them what he did. Uh, oppressing the Jews at that time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told, told Musa in the Quran, Like that's one of the ways for you to come out of your Mashallah. the Mashallah. issue that you're in. So yes, everything has a role, but we're we haven't really you, want to, you want to translate the ayah? Oh I'm sorry. The translation police. <laughs> yeah. The ayah is basically saying that establish salah in your homes, right? According to uh, one tafsir if we take but it's basically saying that establish salah, yani pray your salah in your homes. Uh, well, at that time, they couldn't come out and uh, pray in congregation out in the open. And we can, and we still don't even do that. Uh, and I think it's it's a big blind spot for the Muslims. I mean, they it, it's like we're, we're working with one eye here. We're working on with one eye. And we don't realize that these two things work together, that we need to get our amal in order, along with, obviously, the efforts on... Uh, in all the other avenues as well. Do you know, ever since this started, yani, نقول, yani, we, we obviously say that our, we obviously hurt, we're in pain. Not We're not going to sit here and lie and say that we are in as much pain as they are in. Uh, but we're, we're obviously in, in in pain, simply looking at what's taken place in Palestine, mm-hmm. I think there is one important piece, though, is that we constantly talk about um, what at least caught my attention is that um, ever since this started, there's been a lot of talk about dua, 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 dua. The dua is the weapon of the believer in yani. An, an, an hours long, uh, an hours length lecture about the uh, the, the dua, the ayat, the ahadith, okay. طيب الدعاء له موانعه. Mm. Oh, subhanallah. And, and, and this really gets I'm, me is. Then he's 
I'm saying that dua oh, lahum. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, um, um, uh, dua has its preventers. Yeah, dua has its preventers. Right? Nullifiers, so, right? It's, it's a, yeah, prevent, yeah. It, the nullifier or it prevents yeah. the dua from being answered. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 I took it early. Um, but okay, طيب, and as a khatib, as as a alim, as a sheikh, I'm given an hours long lecture on how to make dua and pray in the last third of the night and so on and so forth. I mean, this is great. Yes, this needs to happen. Okay, but do I not also need to remind the congregation and to teach them that, hey, by the way, by the way, all that is good. We need that. But at the same time, don't be like a person who's pouring water water in a bucket that has a hole at the very bottom of it, right? Mm. So, for example, this يعني, hadith Abu Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu, he says that a man will come, he, his hair is disheveled, right? It's a very prominent hadith. His hair is disheveled. Yani he's come from a, a long journey. Um, he, his, he's all, you know, uh, he's got dust all over him. Mm. He puts his hands in the air. He says, oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah. And then the Prophet ﷺ says that مطعمه من حرام ومشربه من حرام وملبسه بالحرام وغذية بالحرام فأنا يستجاب له. The Prophet says that he's being fed with haram. He's fed with haram. He his clothing is haram, and um, his his uh, whatever he drinks is haram. نعم. And يعني ملبسه his clothing his clothes are haram, right? And of course we can go into whether this is haram في ذاته أو في غيره. That's a different. Yeah. Anyways, this person, in other words, is involved in haram. Now the Prophet ﷺ, at the very beginning of the du'a, he gives uh, uh, he gives the reasons why your du'a is to be accepted. It's a very beautiful hadith, right? At the very beginning of it, he gives you the reasons why your du'a should in, technically, when a person is in safar, he's traveling and he's in that situation, he's wow. tired, his hair is disheveled, he's feeling tired. هذه, right? من موجبات إجابات الدعاء. These are one of the reasons why your du'a technically should be accepted. But mm. after he says the hadith, he gives four reasons as to why this person has these four things. And then he says, فَأَنَّ يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ right? The Prophet now, he doesn't say his dua is not accepted. He says, how can this person's dua be accepted? In other words, يعني, من باب الاستبعاد, like, what? How, you know how we're talking even in English language? Well, yeah. how could he do that? It's من باب الاستبعاد, يعني, how can this person's dua be? Now listen, listen, people are not going to like this, okay? But honestly, how many of our stores who are selling across the nation, just in America, not across the world, are selling haram, they're selling liquor, they're selling pork, at, and they're Muslim owners owning these shops? How many of us have, you know, uh, mortgage houses that we don't need? How many of us are buying things that we don't need? They're, 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 the, the loan in itself, right, is interest-based, right? Not necessarily under the fatwa of if it's necessity versus not necessity. Mm. I mean, today to enjoin good and forbid evil is an evil in itself. Mm. Right? So there's a, how many Muslims, how many Muslims today simply don't pray, just upkeep in the five daily prayers? Honestly, look at the degeneracy that's happening online. Honestly, just just look at some of our sisters and what they're doing online. Just look at it. Two hundred million views, and she's sitting there, and she's got on her dolled up hijab, and she's she's enticing each and every viewer that sees her, right? And no one la yabuhu ahadun bi kalima, right? So mm. this is not me. This is not Yusuf Susi being negative. This is not Yusuf Susi being pessimistic or being you know a, a sinister. No, this is me simply simply putting the dots on top of the huruf. This is all I'm trying to do is that if we really want our dua to be accepted, well, we have to take we have to do our part as well, right? Because b doing your part is making sure that you have the reasons of your dua being accepted while at the same time simultaneously making dua. Now, and I'm sure يعني, لكم, إضافة, if you guys have something to add on that, of course. Yeah, no, I think the point you made about the people's mind doesn't usually go to the fact that there are malania that prevent uh, the dua from acceptance. I remember it just brought to mind the incident I had read in one of the biographies of the Salaf. I don't remember exactly who it was, but maybe it was around Hajjaj bin Yusuf's time or something. But he was, at least he was visiting the Khalifa of the time. And the Khalifa, after giving his advices, he was leaving the Khalifa of the time or the leader of the time. He told him that, uh, I want you to make special dua for me. So mm -hmm. he looked at the leader and he said that, you know what, I'm going to make dua for you. But what is my dua going to do? There's a hundred people behind that door that are making dua against you, that are standing there because of the oh, that you've done to them. So it's my dua against that, like the thousand people out there. 
So he said, I'll make dua for you, but of what benefit is my dua going to do when there's a thousand duas before mine? So people, I think it's an incredibly important point. People need to remember that a lot of times we say, why isn't Allah accepting my duas? We don't look at, you know, how is my life and what am I doing? Uh, am I even it, it, getting the attention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, look for wasail, like your amal and, you know, your uh, avoiding haram and masiyah. Those are important aspects of your dua, istijabu to dua. Sorry. And especially, no, no, I just wanted to say, I think, uh, what, what I think adds salt to the wound or adds, you know, fuel to the fire is that we've become a people who have a problem with the people who are actually enjoying in the good and forbidden the evil. Mm. Like we have a problem with people who are forbidden evil out there. Yani then they become our eternal enemy. So it's not about, and this is like min sifat al munafiqeen, right? Because Allah says, wal munafiquna wal munafiqat ba'aduhum min ba'ad ya'muruna bil munkar wa yanhawna anil ma'roof, right? So today we've become a people who have a, Muslims, we have a problem with people who are not enjoying good. I think everybody's enjoying good. But we have a problem with people who are forbidden evil. Mm. And we're dismissing them as aggressive, lacking wisdom. Oh, and of course, the, the 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 most popular one. You're pushing people away from the masjid, brother. Right? That's the most popular one. That's the cringiest one out there. Um. Mm. So I, I, yeah, in the sins, by the way, the sins when they're in our own four walls, it's different than when it's being publicized and it's 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 accepted. Like you see the sin, you don't even it nothing. It doesn't bother you anymore, because no one is speaking about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Inshallah, Mus'ab, if you want to add anything, Inshallah. Yeah, one, one last thing. What is your suggestion uh, regarding, uh, I guess, going back to the theme of this topic, speaking truth in the face of pressure? Uh, do you have any final suggestions to any uh, du'at, ulama, students of knowledge, or any Muslim leader who's listening? Or even any Muslim, really. Yeah. I think yeah. a lot of Muslims have a certain responsibility to speak truth to power or to speak truth in the face of pressure as well. Yeah. To some uh, degree, everyone has it. Well, I it's um, I think at least for the new upcoming, um, I think the new upcoming du'a through the young students of knowledge is to say to them that do not look at popularity and clout, I think, as the benchmark for success, meaning the success of that person's da'wah, because popularity has never been the benchmark of, of success. And I don't say this because I'm a hater or because I'm hating on, on someone who's popular. No, not at all, right? The Prophet Ali Salatu was salam, he says, يأتي, يأتي يوم القيامة والرجل ومعه الرهط, right? That the person, the, a messenger will come on Yom al he'll have, he'll have only one person with him. It mm. doesn't mean that that uh, Imam, or forgive me, that that messenger or prophet wasn't, you know, prolific enough or they didn't have the right tools or they lacked wisdom. No, it's the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyways, do not look at that as success. The other thing too is make sure use your followers, if you're going to be active on social media, do not become a follower of your followers within time. You have to keep that, is that you do not become a follower of your followers, meaning that you become an entertainer. Okay, mm. you're just going to give them because you know what gets likes, you know, it's usually the cringiest stuff, by the way, that gets all the shares. Right. Um, oh, wow. That's so profound. And then you look at it and you're like, yeah, but that goes against Islam. Yeah, <laughs> Take this down. Right. Um, so that's the other thing, too, is that being on social media is fine. Don't be over consumed by the likes, by the shares. Yes, we all listen. Let's be honest. We all want people to like our posts. We want people to share them. We, it's not about looking for clout or wanting popularity, right? It's you want your message to be heard. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't allow yourself to drift so far away where now without even realizing it, you become a follower of your followers, right? And at the end of the day, use your judgment. Use your, yes, use hikmah, learn from various ulama and mashayikh, right? But do not be completely uh, stumped, I think, by the clout and by the popularity and so on and so forth. Yeah. And now, mashallah, a lot of, uh, you know, a new generation of du'at have come who are taking this uh, this this road. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that number is growing tremendously, inshallah. So uh, to leave with a positive message. Go ahead. I, I I did I did have some, one thing though I, I think that I I I think is important to message uh, mention is that when you're if you're under twenty five I, I don't think you should be out there recording. Sarahatan, this is just my opinion. Mm. Um, it, to each his own. I find so many young Muslims recording daily, 
Mm-hmm. And, and I believe that's yani, الوقت, it's, it's for you to build yourself. It's for you to learn. It's for you to take in the message, right? And this is what kept, for example, myself, this is what kept me for recording for so many years is I didn't want to put something 10 years ago that I would look at right now and you're constantly growing, you're constantly maturing, you're constantly learning. And the more you learn, the more, يعني, right? The more you learn, the more you're willing to kind of pardon this person, excuse that person, to say, no, هذا في خلاف. Well, خلاف, يعني, it's not, it's a legitimate خلاف. You grow and you're not looking to edit all those videos that you recorded. I feel people today, the younger generation, I have to record a video. Mm. I, I feel like there's... Right, uh, Sheikh Asadullah. Yeah. Maybe you can comment, please, please. Maybe you. No, can. it is a very important point. I think because getting into it too early, it's like you know, you get blinded by the lights as opposed to following the responsibility. Uh, it's a responsibility at the end of the day, and uh, you know, uh, at a at a younger age, you may not be ready for that sort of burden or that sort of responsibility. It's a very valid point, Absolutely. and you know, I always tell even the students here that study they. I tell them that don't ever say or do anything today that you're going to have to regret or take back tomorrow. So that means that everything you say and you do, you're going to, you want to do it very carefully and very methodically and, you you know, be fully behind it when you're ready to do it. Don't do things now that, you know, and you, you lose a lot of your uh, uh, sort of standing in, in you know, wh- where does that leave you? you live your life with regrets, basically. And, and again, this is not, I'm not going to mention this person's name. He's, he's, yeah. he's got very, a very good presence out. But I, I think this, this, this person went about things the wrong way. I think instead of climbing the ladder, step one, two, three, he went from step one to step three or four. Um, there's a, there's a way of, of going about things. In other words, Yani, you don't want to come off and present and, and give that image that you're this new yani alama faridu asrih wa faridu dahrih and so on and so forth, only to come out to make some very, very silly. I personally love him for the sake of Allah. I'm not going to mention his name, okay? But what I'm getting at is that there are certain mistakes and غير مختفرة. It's, ah, no, this is not the way you're supposed to climb the ladder. Mm. Right before making this huge presence and so on and so forth, you want to make sure that you're well grounded in just the, at least the basics, right? When it, yeah, and, and I'm just yeah, gonna say you undermine you undermine the mission that you set out for by doing so, uh, you know, by doing that. So, and so about, even, even the even the prophets, right? Like the Prophet said, Allah, he had he was given Nubu at the age of 40, uh, and uh, like, so some may even say the age of 40. Subhanallah and uh, uh, yeah, for yeah. that was uh, one of our shiu. I don't know if it was Sheikh Awama or one of the other elder shiu. He said, "Don't start writing until you know Sorry. after a certain age. Then start actually penning, like writing yeah. and publishing your books. It, Write everything it, down, but publish only after like the age of forty or something." <laughs> I was, I was and very, even yeah, like, putting yourself out there. Yeah, putting yourself like, out there. Yeah, even like uh, marriage, right? Like marriage having. There's some basic life experiences that. When you have them under your belt, uh, like a person who's who's never been married, who's you know, I feel like they, they 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 may evolve a lot, you know, after after marriage and after kids. It doesn't mean you 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 don't you know you wait till too late necessarily probably, but uh, definitely uh, maybe not. Yeah, you a have to, there is a certain level of responsibility that a person should. Uh... Should have. I just feel like the younger the younger generation is is, is carried away with, and again, this is not someone I want to name, but I feel like every day he's got a video, and you're like, okay, I, I don't really think that required a video. I, I feel like it's just more of like, okay, I have to drop a video today. It becomes like a muddle. It becomes like a disease, like an illness. I have to drop a video today. Yeah, and That's I think people much. should re- re- resort to their ulama more than they should to YouTube videos anyway. Uh, that's more helpful, I think, uh, to have a personal relationship with the your scholars and stuff. One hundred percent. Keeping no. that responsibility in front of us, not allowing ourselves to get blinded by the light that comes with that responsibility is. Uh, I guess we'll leave it with those uh, beautiful advices. Jazakumullah khair for the time that you've given us. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reward yourself. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accept it from all of us. Uh, Jazakumullah khairan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put khayr and barakah through the rest of the year. We started off on the topic of truth, inshallah. And, you know, sidq, uh, truth leads towards, you know, khayr and good. And khayr and good leads towards jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make us tread that path, inshallah. Jazakumullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.